Hi, my name is Tim Orney. I'm the graduate coordinator in the Department of Environmental, Earth, and Geospatial Sciences at North Carolina Central University. I'm going to talk about opportunities in our MS program. In terms of our program overview, the mission of our program is to provide intellectual, professional, and personal ex excellence through the highest quality instruction, research, and service in environmental, earth, and geospatial sciences. And we look to become a, a regional, statewide, and national resource for students and society, as well as professionals who work in the many fields that encompass environmental, earth, and geospatial sciences. And what I'm going to do today is talk about some of the opportunities in our program, what DEEGS, that's our program, that's the short name for what we call it, what we do, some of the opportunities in our graduate program, and ways that you can be part of it. In terms of our faculty and staff, like I said before, our department is environmental, earth, and geospatial sciences, and encompass, encompasses a wide array of uh, disciplines. We've got three faculty members who are mainly focused in our environmental sciences, although we kind of cross over, but we have Dr. Bang. He's focused in nanosciences, environmental health, sustainable environments. We have Dr. Yang in remote sensing, pollution control, atmospheric pollution, and Dr. Gerald, who has focused in environmental pollutants and respiratory diseases. We have earth sciences. Dr. Vlahovic, who is currently our, our department chair, is focused in geology, interplate seismicity, tomography, and geoscience education, while our newest faculty member, Dr. Zarzer, his focus is in meteorology, remote sensing, land atmosphere interactions, natural hazard risk communication. And then finally, we have geospatial sciences. We have Dr. McGinn, who's focused in geography, social geography, political geography, and gentrification. Dr. Maholtra, who's focused in GIS, geospatial intelligence, remote sensing, and environmental science. And myself, I focus in GIS, uh, with a focus on geospatial data uh, standards and GIS applications with geography. North Carolina Central University, we're located in Durham, North Carolina. We have about 8,500 students. We're part of the University of North Carolina system. Our actual department, we offer two separate programs. We offer a BS in environmental and geographic sciences with three separate concentrations. We have a concentration in geoscience where you focus more on the earth sciences and GIS and geography and environmental science, which is basically uh, society's impact on the environment, where you focus a, a little bit more on the biology and chemistry component, as well as environmental science classes. We also have an environmental health concentration. And I focused here on the ABM program. This is the uh, newly approved ac accelerated bachelor's master's program. Sometimes it's called a three plus two or a four plus one, where you can take up the nine credits that can be applied to both your BS and your MS while you're still an undergraduate. We also have an MS program in Earth Sciences with an applied and general concentration. So I'm going to talk about the ABM and the application process for that and the MS a little bit later since they, they tie into our BS program. In terms of facilities, we're housed mainly in the Marytown Science Complex. Uh, we have labs, we have environmental science labs, and we transcend both the first and second floor of the Marytown Science Complex. Our master's program is currently 30 credits, and that was reduced from 30 credits a few years ago, so we can give students an opportunity to focus their research in their very last semester. So typically, students who attend full-time, they'll take nine credits for three semesters, and then they'll take three credits in their very last uh, semester focusing on the thesis or the internship. It includes a core requirements, and so these are classes that all students need to take that are offered on a regular basis. And these are methods and techniques in earth science, hydrosphere, lithosphere, and atmosphere, kind of covering the major spheres in earth science. We have a thesis or a project option. We have a statistics requirement, which is typically uh, gained through a, a geostatistics class that we offer. There's no language, language requirement, and you have a deadline of six years to complete the program. And then we have a, a comprehensive examination. At the time of this recording, December 2020, that's going to be the way that this comprehensive exam is going to be assessed, is, is going to be subject to change. The other thing about the DEGS program is that it's offered at night. So if you work during the day, you're able to attend classes at night. So our classes typically start at 5 or 6 o'clock. So there's opportunities for full-time working students to be able to be part of our master's program. 
Now, our expectations for academic progress are that you need to be admitted to candidacy before you can complete a project or thesis. And so admission to candidacy entails that you have a 3.0 GPA, and you have no more than one grade of C earned in your graduate classes. And so if you have a GPA above three, but you also have two C's, you'll need to replace one of those C's. So, you know, it's really important that you really stick with the A's and the B's and don't give yourself too much leeway with any more than one C. We have thesis and projects. A thesis is going to be a, a very specialized study that entails uh, your research interests, applies it to a real world situation, something to me that's going to be on cutting edge. So an existing application cater to your specific interest. Um, it should integrate quantitative methods to prove, disprove. And we have a thesis option and a project option. And typically students in their last semester either focus on the thesis or the project. And the thesis is going to be a little bit more robust. So we really, when we talk, uh, counsel students about doing the thesis, or the project option, think about your long-term goals. Typically a thesis might be for someone who wants to get publications or continue on to a PhD program. So it's a little bit more robust and the requirements are going to be a little bit more stringent. Uh, typically a thesis, uh, is, is going to be, it's going to be a lot longer than a project option and it will be submitted and reviewed for our, through our EDT, Electronic Dissertation and Thesis uh, System, where a project, uh, you write up for a project, is not submitted through that particular system by a particular deadline, so it can be approved for graduation. Your expectations for a research project in uh, graduate school, something that interests you, something that challenges you, something that can be completed with the resources that we have in, on campus or with local partners, uh, something you can present at conferences or workshops. So be sure to take advantage of these opportunities. I'll talk about those, those a little later. So these are just a couple pictures of our uh, former graduate students who've done some research at some uh, local uh, conferences and, symp and symposia. When you select a committee, committee member, member uh, uh, members consist of a chair and two to three other members. So typically a committee is going to have three members. Find someone who's trustworthy, knowledgeable, that can serve as a mentor. You can recruit members outside of your department, but make sure you formally ask them and they accept. And it's important that you keep them updated on their progress. Let them know if you plan to change committee members or, ch uh, or chairs. Okay, so that's really, you know, it, it's really important that you proactive with these people. Uh, the expectations for a thesis proposal, and like I said before, the requirements are a little bit more stringent. Uh, you need to do a thesis proposal in order to be admitted to candidacy. So you have to have your committee in place. It's a 30 minute presentation and that you've already written 10 to 15 pages that has an introduction, a literature review, and prior method, uh, proposed methodology. Be sure to implement suggestions from faculty when you give this thesis proposal. And if you do not do a thesis proposal, a th propose a thesis topic by the end of your third semester, after 27 credits, you'll automatically be placed into the project track. So it's really hard to propose a thesis, be admitted to candidacy, defend the thesis all in one semester. So we have that requirement to kind of force you to space out you know space out the uh, completion of your thesis project option about two-thirds of our students do the project option it's typically occupation-based uh, study or work that focuses on something you may encounter in the workforce doesn't reply, require a proposal but you still need to be admitted to candidacy you need to fill out the same exact forms you need a committee of three members you'll be taking internship credits as opposed to thesis credits in your last semester it still requires a presentation at the end of the semester in which you're graduating. It still requires a paper, but the paper is going to require focus more on the data and methods used to complete the research and come up with the re results. These are some examples of our uh, recent research topics, and just giving them a quick, you know, quick look, you can see some of them. Uh, they transcend the environmental, the earth. Geospatial sciences, you know, they're they're all over the board. So we have skill sets within our department and we have faculty within our department and faculty that we have access to that are able to do and mentor all of these different types of projects.
In terms of funding, when we talk about funding, and that's always important, our faculty, our funding agencies, our graduate schools, what we really want to do is make investments in students. You know, typically we may have projects and we have assistantships and we have work that we want to do, want to get done. And so we make investments in students so that you can do the work and we see you graduate and that's really important we we just can't just get, we the uh, graduate school we don't have we can't afford to just give money away so we, we need something in return so whether it's some research whether it's some grading with a long-term goal of seeing you graduate for the 2021 year our school generated support was reduced by about 50 percent Okay, so in upcoming years i'm, I'm not sure how that's going to be but there probably won't be at the levels that they were in the 2019-2020 year. Now, in terms of funding, we have faculty earn grants. So these are faculty who earn grants from funding agencies and they decide who will work with them based on their subject matter and their merit. And it may include tuition support if the grant allows for it. And faculty will articulate that with you. The graduate school, they supply research and teaching, teaching assistantships so you can work with faculty. So assistantships are provided based on merit and then avail availability. So we as a department, we work together to determine who is going to get the assistantships. And we make re recommendation for funding for the graduate school. In terms of funding, we have a number of students right here. And we have four faculty have uh, full-time assistantships for the summer. And assistantships are typically $1,000 a month, but they may be more depending upon how much money the faculty have uh, received for that particular grant. So they could be up to $1,500 a month. And so faculty might pick all of these students to work with them on their particular project because their skill sets align, motivation, time availability also align with them as well. And then the graduate school might say, we have four assistantships and we can be full assistantships or half assistantships. So we can decide who are going to get the full assistantships who are going to get the half assistantships. Okay, so it's, it's really important that you know, you're there and that you're able to demonstrate that you, know, you deserve an assistantship. And like I said before, our funding is going to be more and more limited as, uh, kinda, as um, we proceed through this, uh, uh, proceed further and further. In terms of funding, faculty have the discretion to depend on how and when their grant monies are spent. And so this can be for a variety of factors, interest in class, how you do in their class, fit with their research project, availability. Uh, like I said before, if we need someone there, you know, teaching classes during the day and you work full time, then you know, that's not going to be a possibility. So we might have money for you to grade some online classes or whatever if you work during the day, if that money's available. Uh, faculty grants are hit and miss. So if faculty funding is high, then more students can be funded. If not, less funding needs to be spread out amongst more students. So it's really important that we, you know, you're able to you know, get onto some projects and do really well so that your funding continues more and more. In terms of tuition remission, so faculty might have grants that they're able to provide students with tuition remission. So they might give, you know, tuition remission to the same two students that they're funding. And then the DEGS gives us an allocation. Okay, the graduate school gives us an allocation of how much we can spend on in-state and out-of-state students. And we typically try to split that, split that up as, as evenly as we can between the students receiving uh, funding. Okay, and this includes tuition, but not fees. Okay, so it includes tuition, but not fees. Now, when we talk about expectations for research teaching assistantships for students, our allocation for future work is based on current work. So current awards are not indicative of future awards. And those will be things that you'll that'll be clearly articulated through the faculty. Part of your aid packages revolves around teaching and research assistantships. So if you're doing research, you're going to have expectations to produce products, uh, deliverables for your particular faculty member that you're going to be working with. If you're assigned with a uh, faculty member to do teaching, you're going to have to you know, grade or whatever needs to be done. For faculty grants, your advisor 
will file the paperwork, but you will work with HR to ensure you get paid. So if you're typically, uh, you need to supply, you know, your driver's license or your social security card in order for you to actually get paid, but your advisor will file, file the appropriate paperwork. For graduate school assistantships, I, I'm the graduate coordinator. I'll make recommendations to our administrative assistant. We'll process them and send you emails that you need to respond to in order to uh, finalize the hiring process. And then the expectations for teaching assignments, you're going to be on time, clarity with the uh, students, excellent dealing with students, clarity with instructor, presence with the instructor, that you're always there. So it's really important that you know you show up on time and you're going to be, you know, you, you're going to be helping and supporting undergraduate research, graduate research, whatever faculty members need. Uh, in addition, I have no control if a faculty member wants to keep funding you on their grant. So if they don't want to fund you anymore because of substandard work, there's absolutely nothing that I can do about it. Okay. What I would suggest is you know, be proactive with faculty, ask them what they need so that we don't run into these issues. You know, you're done, you know, you're you know, you've been here a year, you were funded for a year, and a faculty member no longer wants to fund you. You know, it's a difficult position for me. Maybe we'll have some some uh, funding from the graduate school for you, but typically faculty funding levels are much higher than the funding from the assistantships that we have to spread around, spread around to every student. These are just some examples of some milestones that we have. Uh, and what I wanted to focus on is days to submit your, your thesis project, master's projects, all these, you know, all the other deliverables that you need as as you start to graduate. Uh, as you start to graduate, you you notice that you know November is you know beginning of November, even though our classes typically end first week of December, are when we have things due because we don't want to be rushed. We want to make sure we give you the opportunity to make any edits, completions, uh, prepare for your defense. So it's really important that we stick to these particular dates. So these are just some sample dates. And so in the spring semester, typically we want you giving your thesis or your project, finalized thesis or project write up to faculty first week of April or so. In terms of graduate school, and these are some recommendations that I have. You know, you get out of it what you put into it. Okay, we talk about habits. You know, and habits are the intersection of skill, knowledge, and desire. And what we try to do in graduate school is provide you with the skills and some of the knowledge, and you provide the desire. Okay? And this knowledge is really important in terms of why do we do something? You know, we'll provide the skills, whether it's GIS, you know, statistics, air quality, you know, water quality, or everything that we do in these classes. Other things, proactivity, making sure that you're forward about seeking out an advisor, talking to people. Think big picture. Okay, what are some of the big picture goals that you want to do? Do you want to get that promotion at work? Do you want to earn your master's? What are you going to do with this master's? Because this is a, a major investment in time, is a major investment in money. Also enhance your skill sets. So while you're a graduate student, we have access, and me being a GIS person, we have access to ESRI, ESRI uh, training tutorials. Take advantage of those training tutorials so that you can enhance your skill set. Maybe pick up a little programming or you know, online or cloud-based mapping and get an idea as to where the, you know, where the field is going and make sure your skills align with the skills that are going to be needed in the work set, in the workforce. Uh, create synergies, meaning if you've taken a, a, if you know someone over in chemistry or biology, work with them. And to me, this is a big one. Think win-win. What are ways that you know you, everyone can win from your particular uh, research topic or work here? Um, you might have been assigned to a particular faculty member, and they're doing some research. You know, just go forward with that. Take advantage of that. If there was something that a project that you did for a particular class, there's a project that you're doing for a particular class. Take off with that and do that for your thesis or your project. And then also remember, you're always being graded. Okay, me, 
I like to pick out students uh, for my faculty projects that I have in class. So if you're showing up 10 minutes late and we need to be over at the NCDOT at a particular time, well, you showing up late is really not a good harbinger for what I might see in the future. So just remember, you're always being great. Everything that you turn in, everything that you write, the way you present yourself, all that, all those other things. We, we call them, you know, the soft skills and the hard skills are really going to be reflected in the decisions that we make, make in the assessment and the evaluation that we have. We talk about some successful students, less successful students. These are just some of the habits that we've seen. Um, in terms of uh, our more successful students, they have a strong presence on, uh, on campus or during the day or after work. We've had working students and they might take off of work, you know, every other Friday in the afternoon and come on campus and work and we see them. Our less successful students, we rarely see them during the day, only present during class. In terms of returning emails and communications promptly, our less successful students, they go days or weeks without being heard from. Our more successful students, they keep our advisors, committees appraised of their progress. Our less successful students, they only contact their advisor when they need something, or you know, we only, you know, I need a PIN number or something like that to get registered. So it's really important that you're just being proactive with everyone. More successful students, and I alluded to this before, give themselves enough leeway for defenses and submissions of forms and papers. A lot of times, our less successful students often submit and defend at the last minute, sometimes delaying graduation if a problem arises. And every semester, we always have, we typically have one or two students. Typically, uh, we have one or two students who have to graduate in the summer or the following semester because you know they submit their thesis or project at the very last minute and it needs major edits and these edits can't get done before the submission date okay and, and I hate having those conversations but those are some things that that need to be had okay, so be very proactive about giving yourself enough time uh, our, our successful students, they take advantage of internship opportunities. Um, and they take opportunities to present at workshops or, you know, workshops and uh, conferences. And we have some local conferences that are, you know, what I call low-hanging fruit. You know, in particular, in my skill set, we have uh, Southeast Geographers uh, Conference, North Carolina Geographical Society, North Carolina GIS Conference. These are all opportunities out there to present at. Okay, that you don't have to take off of work or travel overnight. So take advantage of those. Um, more successful students, we attend seminars, okay, and talks put on by the DEGS and other STEM programs. And then some, some of our less, less successful students don't take advantage of talks and seminars on campus. So just take advantage of the, take advantage of the opportunities available to you out there. These are just a couple of our successful, um, our success stories. Uh, this is Courtney. She graduated uh, in 2017. She did an international internship. Uh, she wrote papers and uh, she wrote and published papers while in school with another one of our graduate students. And she currently works as a staff hydrologist at uh, Southwest Florida Water District. And if I remember right, she came to us from uh, Duke and ECU. But she works as a staff hydrologist. Uh, you know, she, she did a great job, came in here and did an internship and uh, is doing great things out in the workforce. Uh, this is Richard. Richard was an international student. Uh, he did work on food deserts and food access in southeastern North Carolina. And he did an internship at Esri. Esri are the people who make, is the company who makes uh, a good amount of the GIS software in Charlotte in 2017. And he ended up getting a full-time job for Esri in um, after he graduated in fall 2017. And he currently works as a business and market strategy analyst for Lowe's companies down in Charlotte. And so he works full time down in Charlotte. He did a lot of great things. He took advantages to, he took advantages of travel opportunities. He presented at uh, Southeast Department of AG. He presented at the National Society for Black Engineers. He did a lot of great things while he was here. Uh, this is Nelson. Uh, Nelson earned his BS in the DEGS in 2013. He was one of my first uh, first GIS students when I started uh, at NCCU in 2010. Uh, Nelson was, you know, an internship person. He internshiped at a number of different places. We placed him 
Uh, he placed himself with the UNC Department of Transportation and the NCDOT, but he, we also placed him with a, a private company during the semester. Um, he was our GIS guru here. He was uh, he could point and click and do pretty much anything. Um, he did a master's project linking water quality with malfunctioning septic systems, and he currently works as a photogrammetrist for the NCDOT. He did a short uh, he did a stint down with the Army Corps of Engineers in Charleston, and then had found an opportunity to come back home and he works for the NCDOT and he's been there for a few years now. And then you, maybe you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the application process and uh, I'll be, you know, I'll be uh, tidying things up here. But the application process, we apply through the NCCU grad, graduate school and there's the link and I'll provide it also in the description uh, on my, when this is posted to uh, social media channels things that we need to make a decision. So in order to render a decision, we need an official transcript. And we typically look at grades within the last two years in your major. Okay, so if your first year you didn't do so well, it, it, we probably won't weigh that as heavily as your grades within the major in the last two years. Letter of interest, that's important. What are you interested in? Did you go through and look at the faculty and, you know, I wanna study with Dr. McGinn or I wanna study with Dr. V or study with Dr. Bang. Do your interests intersect with any of the interests on campus and in our department? Two letters of recommendation and then GRE scores. Uh, GREs are required by the graduate school, but I can, uh, I can ask that they be waived for say our ABM students who, have, who we know or under extraordinary circumstances such as the pandemic or anything else that comes up. International applicants, the deadlines are a little bit more stringent and early. So please work directly with Ms. Lewis in the international office for the required materials. Other materials that you may need include um, test of English as a foreign language, bank statements, uh, commitments from, the, from, from our department. So please work with her you know, directly. You know, a lot of times what I, I tell folks is, you know, we let you you know, we apply and we um, okay the applications in the department, but there's still a lot of things that need to happen in order for you to get on campus. So we say if it's okay for you to, you know, study MS, you know, study in our MS program, but Miss Lewis, you got need to work with Miss Lewis to make sure you can be on campus. We uh, have two different admission types. We have conditional, so they can be given for a number of different reasons. You know, maybe you haven't taken your GREs yet, although you've scheduled them. Um, your grades below uh, 2.75 GPA, maybe the courses within your major you haven't taken a lot of. And that basically means you can't be provided with departmental support, but it can be changed to unconditional after meeting stipulations. So if you come here and, you know, earn a GPA of 3.0, you'll be moved from conditional to unconditional. And if you're unconditional, you're able to receive departmental support. So these assistantships and tuition support that I've talked about before. So it's really important that you're applied unconditionally so you're eligible to receive that particular support. This is just a sample of our program and I, I've posted this in our, in our uh, Google Drive and I, I'll post a link to that at the end as well. But you can see all, all the information here, 0 to 9 credits, 9 to 18, 18 to 27, where you, you know, take uh, our comprehensive exam in one form or another. Uh, you're admitted to candidacy. And then all the kind of check marks that you, you and your advisor will work through as, you, as we look towards graduation. These are some resources, and I'll post this. Uh, I'll post this link as well. But these have forms. These have, these have pre previous thesis write-ups project write-ups, candidacy forms, supporting documents, application resources. So these are readily available so that you can look at, and download, and you know, kind of get an idea as to our program. And I'll post some other links as well to our department and our individual faculty members as well. Last thing I was going to talk about was our ABM program. I alluded to this before, but this was approved in 2018, and we had our first graduates in 2020. So these are for it's you know accelerated bachelor's master's program and basically these are NCCU BS students that can take up the three graduate level courses that can be applied to both undergraduate and graduate classes and this is really, we had our uh, we had a student 
just graduate in uh, December of 2020, who graduated with his BS in December 2019. So he knocked out credits in the spring, summer, and fall, and was able to get finished in one calendar year. So if you're taking cross-listed classes with those, because typically our, our graduate classes, they may be cross-listed with an undergraduate class. That means they, they meet at the same time at five or six o'clock in the evening. If you wanna get credit in the ABM program, you must be registered for the graduate level class. It's called EASC as opposed to GEOG or ENSC and do the requirements for the graduate level class. I'm just going to use an example. I teach you a geostatistics class that, that's cross-listed as, uh, as uh, EASC 5130 and GEOG 4130. And there's more requirements for the graduate students as opposed to the undergraduate students. So if you're in the ABM program, you need to do the requirements for the graduate level students in order to get graduate level credit. Okay, no if ands or buts. Okay, and that's what you know. Uh, that's what the uh, ABM program entails. And this is just a sample form, so you need to be a. And this is the application. So if you apply for this, uh, you need to be a junior senior, have an overall G, uh, GPA of 3.0, and it needs to be approved by the uh, by the graduate program advisor, department chair, and the dean of the graduate school. And after that, you will be able to apply and take graduate level courses as an undergraduate that can be applied to your graduate program. And to me, to all students, I recommend they do this, even if they are thinking about or not interested in joining our program, is that one is that you already have these credits that can be applied to our master's program. And two, you've got graduate level classes that might be able to be applied to others mas other master's programs that are sitting on your transcript. So we've got some outreach. We've got some Instagram. We've got some YouTube. We've got some Facebook. So please reach out to us. See what we have going on there. And then this is my contact information. Okay. So tmulroon at nccu.edu. Feel free to contact me with any questions about our program, our MS, our ABM program, even our bachelor's program, and I can send you in the, in the right direction. But we really look forward to having you part of our program. Please contact with me with any questions, and I hope to hear from you soon.